All right. Uh, welcome to another week of Democracy with the Diamond Stones. I'm Owen Diamond Stone. And I'm Natasha Diamond Stone. I'm Peter Diamond Stone, and I'm related to these two. Uh, last week, we discussed whether it was possible for meaningful change to happen from within the Democratic Party, or whether change would have to happen outside the party. So perhaps we'll recap that quickly and then discuss what form that change might happen if it wasn't able to take place within the Democratic Party. And I think I suggest that that required reading for this session would be Peter Cameo's Avocado Declaration. Cameo was in his early years a member of the SWP, if I recall, right? He may even have been a presidential candidate, but then became a member of Peace and Freedom in California and a candidate for governor in that screwed up uh, election that ended up making Schwarzenegger or whoever it was. Um, uh, Cameo's thinking on the relationship of the Democratic and Republican parties to each other is really paramount to understanding that no change can take place, or at least the Democratic Party exists for the purpose of limiting change for the protection of the holders of capital in this country. Um, so you're saying, I'm saying that huh? this man had a writing um, about no change being possible in the system that we have now? Not is that, that what no you're saying? change is possible, but the purpose of the Democratic Party is to limit it so nothing serious can happen. Okay. All right, it's not that no change can happen. We have to look, explore some topics that the Democratic and Republican parties, the Green Party, the Reform Party, the capitalist parties, no matter big one or small one, will never explore. And yet they are things about which we have some kind of hunch. Start with paying fines. A fine as a criminal penalty is really the imprisonment of yesterday. Not the whole of yesterday, not the part of yesterday when you slept or when you eat, but the part of yesterday when you worked. Mm -hmm. So if you make, if there's a fine of $100 and you made $10 an hour, the fine is the imprisonment of 10 hours. If you made $20 an hour, it's the imprisonment of five hours. But supposing you don't get paid by the hour, you just get money from your investments. Uh-huh. Right? How can you, a fine have any effect on your life? It can't. You can't imprison yesterday's hours for a person who doesn't get paid by the hour, who just collects coupons, mm -hmm. or who makes capital gain. Could, so what you're saying is fines, they aren't an egalitarian way of um, punishing people for infractions of the law. They but, should, people should just go to jail. But could that, could that change happen necessarily within the system? That seems like a change that, I don't know, is there any reason why a major political party couldn't put abolish all fines on their platform? And put all penalty, criminal penalties as time in jail? Well, that would be very expensive for taxpayers. Only if you made not uh, silly things criminal, like smoking marijuana. Which is currently... Yeah, so you get lots of people going to prison for doing stupid things. What about... I mean, for stupid What about reasons. stupid things like driving too fast? We find a lot of people for driving too fast. Yeah. And there's got to be some way to keep people from driving too fast. Send them to prison. So speeders should be sent to prison. So what happens to the wealthy guy whose chauffeur is driving for him? Mm, Does he go to prison? Question. 
I, I ask you, what, what would happen to the <laughs> chauffeur? Would we send the chauffeur to prison? No. We make only one class of wealth holders. Everybody owns approximately the same amount of wealth from one end of the earth to the other. No distinctions between Bangladeshi and U.S. citizens. With lots of prisons. For what? <laughs> with lots of prisons for speeders. It's for speeders. <laughs> now, that, it may be that the, you'll only go for two hours. Mm. Right, so you oh, know, to prison for to two prison hours. prison for two hours for speeding. But but like then putting a is kid it in the corner or you know time out. If you had a classless society where everyone was getting paid equally for their labors, then finding them a fixed amount would also be equal. That's right. To their labor, so you now, could now find a fine, people now, and you yeah, wouldn't have to right, imprison them. Right. But a fine has so but much. Only when all people are earning. Up, not earning, but own approximately, because it's the earning that's mm. not really crucial. Uh, but that the ownership of the society's particularly productive wealth is shared by all the people of the planet. And I would start with the drug companies. Now you hear the, the Democrats and the Republicans talk about whether we could get drug prices down. Well, if we owned the drug company, we wouldn't have to have the discussion, would we? That's yeah. the key. That the community owns the major means of production and distribution. That goes with equality of ownership of the wealth of the society. And throughout the entire world. Yeah, you can't do it in one in Venezuela and not in Mexico, in Mexico and not in the United States. And that's the reason is that as long as there is one, particularly one that can rip off its people so that it can have an expensive military, if there's one that can do that, the capitalist system will do everything in its power to prevent the change that is brought about by yeah. community ownership. And so, I mean, even if we can go back to 1917 if we want the capitalist countries of the world said whoa whoa let's stop this beating each other up we got a problem over there um, in Asia and Eastern Europe we've, we've got to do something about that so they decided to stop beating each other up and end the first world war and then they shook hands and they invaded the Soviet Union and conquered most of the Soviet Union. Where, where this, where's the justification for that? What's in, more interesting is how come they chose the 11th of November? It's the hanging day of the Haymarket Martyrs. Martyrs, yeah. Uh, Co-opt the holiday. And they did. Hardly anybody, people know about May 1st and May 4th. You know, May 1st and May 4th is when uh, students were fired on in Kent State when Tiananmen Square started, uh, when Mao Zedong started the first demonstration in uh, Shanghai, I think it was. So May 4th and May 1st still retain visibility, but, May, but November 11th is lost. Uh, the overthrow of governments, uh, the attempt by capitalists to finance Hitler so that he could invade the Soviet Union when our invasions failed. And, uh, Mossadegh in 1953. I mean, you can recite forever. Mm -hmm. Every time. And, and the more, the, one of the more interesting ones was I, um, Arbenis. He didn't want to take what? property away from the wealthy in Guatemala. He just wanted to give a little bit of state land to everybody mm -hmm. so that they could support themselves and do, do subsistence farming. Well, that's depriving capitalism of its source of, source of wealth, which is somebody else's labor. Uh -huh. um, so Hillary Clinton was the one who um, had people go into Guatemala and crush that movement, right? 
No, that was like no? That was no, no, totally that's, no, oh, that's, okay. no, I think, I think that, what am I thinking of? You're thinking about something more recent in Honduras. Honduras, okay. Recently. But, you know, as we do regime change, Saddam Hussein was a communist. Everybody got education that they needed or wanted the, at popular expense. Libya and Gaddafi's, you know, that one's probably the, one of the more interesting since we've been battling with Libya since um, 1800. Uh, and Benghazi and Tripoli had opposing governments back then. We mentioned one, but how about not dealing with fines, which can point out we can deal with if everybody has the same... If, if money is the worth, if has the same worth to everyone. Everybody, yeah. But how about government interference in the market for the protection of the capitalists known as patents? And that's, without patents, government interference, we could have. Whew. Terrible word. Competition. Competition. Or cooperation. But it's patents that make capitalism possible, patents and copyrights. I mean, um, why shouldn't somebody be able to copy the book and print it and sell it somewhere else without paying the author? The author did, gave what the author could, from each according to ability, to each according to need. So if the author needs food, the society will provide food. One might take the argument that um, patenting and protecting people's rights to intellectual and physical inventions. Property. Property. Um, facilitates people's desire to make new innovations and discoveries. And without without the reward promised by patents and copyright, people would be less inclined to innovate. Nice. You mean we're not gonna get a new form of system every couple of years on our computers that we can buy another system? Exactly. <laughs> and yeah, well. Uh, or we'll I, I, all I would, become farmers. We might not I would be inclined to say, or we, well, you think that the scientists who do that research would are motivated principally by money? No, I'm not. I'm trying to hold that argument. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is Good. not me arguing. This is okay. me holding is that an, is, an, uh, is, it, is an argument about the issue. I. See, I think we people would do that. We'd get more books written and more to think, more innovation if we didn't have the patents and copyrights which restrict people from really making progress. And the next step probably would be to reduce the work week to whatever we get paid an hour f reduce it to 20 hours a week because we really don't need to be working this many hours to produce more words that I probably shouldn't use on television. <laughs> um, You'd get them bleeped out. Get them bleeped. I recently read an article um, saying that the best thing you can possibly do for the environment is cut back your work week. Is that work, right? Just work less hours. Oh, gee, that, that was a good shot, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, I was lucky. I don't always come out that lucky. <laughs> I think it might have been a German study. Uh huh. It makes sense. Not to produce so many automobiles, not to produce so many trips around the world sponsored by somebody on PBS that doesn't have sponsors, you remember? Um. And that's, that brings me to another one. Tax exemptions for the wealthy. Mm -hmm. 
Nobody challenges foundations um, and their tax-exempt status, but all that is is an outlet for the wealthy to either control our culture, control our education, or control our religious beliefs. It strikes me as being a violation of the First Amendment to exempt religious institutions from taxation because I don't see the First Amendment as a freedom of religion any more than it is a freedom from religion. But the fact that it violates the Constitution is arguable one way or another, but it isn't important. What's important is somebody's beliefs are getting subsidized by the people who don't agree with those beliefs. Why is it that we have so much British culture on public television? <laughs> I don't know. Who made the choices? Well, the wealthy through um, their foundations. The Ford Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> I think something's dripping. Is there a hole in the scene? There's a hole in the bucket, dear Liza, dear Liza. Well, okay, so you're saying that... That's the kind of subject that the two-party system, the capitalist political system, will never consider. That is, Harvard, we, the ordinary people, are supporting the people who go to Harvard with a tax exemption on their ownership and stock. And we, the ordinary, uh, non, non, um, religious are supporting churches mm -hmm. around the country yeah. by providing them with a police force to protect them and roads to get to the churches, but not taxing the churches themselves. Mm -hmm. Going back to what you said, change, big change, is not possible in this two-party system. You just said that. So it needs to come from the people. So change needs to have a grassroots startup. And the people of the entire world mm -hmm. need to have that common interest in mind, is what you're saying, right? And it's, In a nutshell. it's particularly difficult here because the wealthy control culture, mm -hmm. the wealthy control religion, the wealthy control education. So if you brainwash a kid from virtue, from preschool. Or before. Or now before. like little two-year-olds have iPads. That a more and more difficult task through reason. And so now it has to come through that we know that there's something wrong about Harvard not paying taxes on its uh, investment income. I didn't know that. I guess I've been brainwashed. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you hear it, you know there's something wrong. And there's something wrong with religious institutions' belief in believe whatever you call yourself a religion, whether it's Scientology or Christianity, I mean, define cult and you'll find Christianity is a cult. Um, but why should the people who don't believe in any of that, I, I don't know any way to describe it all, but I would call it myths and mirages. Um, why should we have to support that? But we do, and we do it without reflection, and we do it because we do it without reflection because the major political parties, the capitalist political parties, will not confront those sources of revenue mm -hmm. for education, religion, and culture.
Matt, I would love to watch the advertising on PBS. You know, you got this big river boat going down a river in Europe, and they say, but we don't have any advertising. Horse pucky. Or as Biden would say, malarkey. Um, another form that we don't, we, we got a little of this when we talked about fines, but the corporate form, if I were to dump as much oil in the ocean as Exxon did in Alaska, I might face the death penalty. Who I mean, I, I don't know what, but it wouldn't be easy. So, how many people from Exxon went to jail? No one. They just paid a fine. <laughs> Wait, are you serious? Or are no, you he's right. Really? Yeah. Um, so the corporate form exists to protect the owners of capital, not only from, from not going to jail, but um, in some instances paying taxes. The Ford Foundation gets money from, <laughs> from Fords. For what purpose? Why should the Ford Foundation get any money at all? <laughs> <laughs> Unless they pay income taxes on the money that they get. Until those kinds of anomalies on which this system survives are inquired into by people separately from the institutions of our political system, because they will never consider it until we do. Nothing can change. Maybe the first change should come in the taxation of foundations, educational institutions, and religious institutions. That's a big enough battle in and of itself, and it will be the people against the political parties, the capitalists, whether it's Jill Stein or any, on up, it doesn't matter. Um, You're saying perhaps Perhaps those battles will be taken up by the capitalists, such as Jill Stein. What? You're saying those battles would be taken on by the the, the battle to uh, tax foundations and churches would be taken up by some capitalists. No. Such, you're saying it would be against capitalists, right. such as Jill Stein. The capitalist parties from mm. from Jill Stein uh, on up, uh, from the smallest capitalist party to the largest. Hill. And, and I have a feeling that we may have a similar problem with socialist parties because people have been so brainwashed that they don't know what is in their own self-interest. And I hear that quite often coming from labor leaders saying, hey, the workers don't know what's in their own self-interest. Um, and that may be the key that someplace there has to be the, a beginning of understanding that the political process exists like the court system to protect the owners of the major means of production and distribution. Now Sanders can rail against how much of a percentage of our profits and income that they get um, but he never will say that they should get none. He never will say that, or he doesn't seem to be willing to say, that the major means of production and distribution should belong to the community at large and not to private individuals. And the drug industry is probably the biggest of those. So we have like four or five minutes here to wrap it up. So perhaps.
perhaps um, we should sing a song. <laughs> There's a hole in my bucket, bucket dear. dear. <laughs> well, if it's a beer bucket, we better get a straw. Um, and maybe that's what we should be talking about, too, is the age restriction on voting, the age restriction on consumption of alcoholic beverages, and what are we going to do about marijuana? All those things a little segments of what the real issues are. Um, I have a question. Um, don't ask me. <laughs> so, do you think that it's the parents' place to make sure that if, if there were no laws on alcohol consumption, do you think it would be the parents' place to tell their five-year-old child not to drink the wine? Or do you think that that five-year-old child should be able to make that decision for themselves. Ah, uh, well. I uh, had my first drunk when I was 10 at a Passover Seder. <laughs> that man is <laughs> <laughs> I do it every time. I woke up the next morning with such an awful headache that it took me a long time to try it again. Um, so. Experiential learning may be useful, may not be the only way to go, but um, it has its merits. You don't just tell the kid, oh, put your hand there, right there on that stove top. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe you can warn them about it. You can't warn my cat. Uh, <laughs> she's going to get it one of these days. Um, I don't know how to deal with issues like that. Um, and one of the things I need to tell you, it, in, in the process of change, I don't really have a lot of answers. Mm -hmm. I know what things need to be altered, banished. I mean, I can talk about the age of voting and say, we should have no voting age. Yeah. And I've been saying that for as long as I can remember. There should be no restriction on voting age. They can't do any worse than we do. And my son comes back from a trip to Spain and he says the kids come out of school in the afternoon and go sit down and have a, not a milkshake but a glass of wine. Uh, he says the only, the only drunken kids he saw were the Taurus. Right? So maybe experiential learning works in more ways and, and it's perfectly safe. And, you know, things like prostitution being legal. I mean, that really, or in criminal prosecutions, you don't prosecute the, pros the, the prostitute, you prosecute the Johns. That seems to me to be a crucial issue in, in liberation of people. But we'll never get raised um, more than this. Can we make money taxing it? Like, we, can we make money on marijuana taxing it? And Liberty Union has taken the position, no. Um, the state can't make, should not make money, a profit on its drug sales because that leaves an opening for a black market. And the one thing you want to eliminate from the system is private enterprise in the black market. Okay. All right. Well, with that, I think we'll call this session of Democracy with the Diamond Stones. And don't, and don't forget to take a look at Avocado Declaration. I've got it up yeah. right here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week. Or next month. Mm -hmm.